Okay, so next up we have our Models for Change panel, or what we hope to be examples of people that are doing things right, either in the policy world or in the farming world. So um, please welcome our Models for Change panel. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sofia Kruszewski. I am the director of the Food and Agriculture Clinic here at Vermont Law School. Um, our clinic is one of a very small number of law schools in the country that are devoted exclusively to the law and policy of food and agriculture. Uh, and we work with farm and food clients at the state and the regional and the national level to answer their questions related to regulatory compliance, to support their legislative and administrative advocacy efforts, and to develop educational resources for the farmers and farm workers and food businesses in their communities. And our work regularly reminds me uh, that each farm and each community is unique and there's no one single approach that we can expect to work everywhere, whether that's in agricultural production or whether that's in our approach to our laws and policy. And so I'm just delighted to welcome this panel um, to Vermont Law School, which is focused on exploring uh, different approaches to this question of reconciling agricultural production and farm viability with environmental constraints and environmental goals. Um, and so we have a, a diverse array of speakers here to share their experiences and observations in agriculture and environmental law uh, from the south, from the west, and from here in the northeast. And so we'll first hear from Lee Miller, who is a lecturing fellow of law in the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. Um, who also farms in Hillsborough, North Carolina. And then we'll hear from Philip Chavez, who has been involved in production agriculture for most of his life and currently is the managing partner for Diamond Day Farm in Colorado and a partner in Mohawk Valley Farms in Yuma, Arizona. And then last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Lisa McCrory, who is a consultant, teacher, activist, organic farmer, and co-owner of Earthwise Farm and Forest, which is just down the road in Bethel, Vermont. Um, so I'm keeping their bios short. Um, you can read more about them in, in your pamphlets, but also just to give them more time to share with you about their farms and their work. And then after we hear from them, we'll open it up for questions and discussions about these approaches that they share, about ideas that they spark for you, um, additional challenges that remain, and then what opportunities these challenges might present. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Lee. Um, so you've, you've stuffed yourself with a fabulous lunch and you've heard a lot of amazing speakers and you're ready for the weekend and I get it. Um, but I'm going to try and, and keep you awake by really taking you on a kind of a breakneck ride. So I'd say uh, buckle up. Um, and that's because I'm going to talk about hogs in my home state of North Carolina. I'm going to tell you about how they are raised, the environmental and health consequences. I'm going to give you a brief history of the failed policy efforts to mitigate those harms. And I'm going to tell you about a couple of more recent legal strategies um, that may be making some headway going forward. And then I'm going to zoom out and try and connect hogs in North Carolina to the other issues that we've heard about today. So bioenergy, we just heard about, resilient ag, um, and of course, climate change. So that'll give me a, a chance, I think, to share my hopes and also some of my very significant fears um, about the torrent of research, of policy, uh, and above all, money that is um, coming down the pike and that's about to be thrown around as agriculture really becomes a focus of climate mitigation strategies. Okay, does that sound good? Swine in North Carolina are an environmental health and justice problem, and they're a wicked problem. Um, let me give you some background on that to start. In 1982, there were more than 11,000 swine farms in North Carolina. Then came the boom of consolidation and industrialization. By 1998, there were fewer than 3,000 operations left, and we were producing more swine than we, were, than, um, than we had been in the early 80s. And in fact, we were responsible for about 95% of the growth in swine nationally over that decade and a half. The 2,300 or so operations um, that remain today rely on the lagoon and spray field system. You might be familiar with it. Basically, hog waste is flushed from confinement barns into online earthen pits, 
where it digests a bit before it's sprayed using what amounts to industrial sprinklers, sprayed by what amounts to industrial sprinklers onto nearby cropland. So there's an image there. Um, for reasons that include uh, the construction in the 1980s of the world's largest swine uh, processing facility in Tar Heel, North Carolina, the real kicker um, is that these operations are heavily concentrated in a handful of poor counties in the, close, in the coastal plain that's down in the southeast there, where the most prominent geological features are their sandy soils, high water tables, and proximity to the coast. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, I'm gonna take you on a quick tour through some of the harms that are caused by this particular production system at this particular concentration, because uh, you don't really see it anywhere else in the country, quite like it is um, in this part of North Carolina. So I'll start with some of the classic environmental harms. Water pollution. Lagoons can flood in adverse weather events and run off into surface waters. Waste can leach through lagoons into groundwater and reach surface water through hydrological connections. Oversaturation of spray fields can lead to runoff into surface water. And surface water contamination, of course, affects wildlife and leaves residents unable to fish or otherwise use and enjoy those public waters. Air pollution. CAFOs emit volatile organic compounds like dimethyl sulfide and ammonia um, and particulate matter. And a lot of this gets blown out of the barns by these huge fans. Third, oh, not jumping ahead. Um, third, antibiotic resistant pathogens and the antibiotics themselves can travel through both air and water vectors. And fourth, and this is not a comprehensive list, we're moving quickly, these facilities create nuisance conditions for the neighbors who live next door to them. Um, and I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. Okay, human health, especially the health of people who live in these communities. A recent Duke Health study found that living near a swine CAFO is associated with higher mortality, higher hospitalizations, and greater rates of disease. So this particular study um, found that residents living near a swine CAFO had higher rates of all-cause mortality and infant mortality, higher rates of mortality from anemia, kidney, kidney disease, tuberculosis, and septicemia, and higher rates of emergency department visits and hospital admissions for low birth weight. And they found that these outcomes were worse still among groups that were living uh, among uh, the highest animal densities, basically per square kilometer. That's how they measured it. Um, and I mean, it's easy to get lost in, in the jargon and these statistics and these studies. But uh, if you think about it, what I'm really saying is living near a swine CAFO is killing people. That's, the, that's what's coming out of these, um, this work at, uh, from Duke Health. OK, that leads me to this. We cannot understand the harms of this system, the lagoon and spray field system, without understanding their disproportionate impact on communities of color. We cannot. Um, this is a classic environmental justice, really an environmental injustice situation. So the map that you're looking at overlays industrial hog operations, which are the black dots, and I apologize, it's probably hard to see at the back, um, uh, over the concentrations of communities of color in red, uh, if you could look underneath the black dots, you would see a whole lot of red, but the, the density of these CAFOs is so, such that it, you can't really even see it on this map uh, without zooming in quite a bit. For many years, a University of North Carolina epidemiologist named Steve Wing, who passed away a couple of years ago, um, used community-based participatory research to document the effects of swine CAFOs on communities in eastern North Carolina. And he showed that people of color are much more likely to live near industrial swine facilities and specifically the proportion of people of color living within three miles of a swine CAFO is 1.46 times higher um, than for the non-Hispanic white population. It's about one and a half times higher for black folks, and it's about 2.2 times higher for Native Americans. Um, and as Dr. Wing concluded, quote, this is a spatial pattern recognized as environmental racism. This will in turn be out, uh, sorry, this will turn out to be important um, in a minute when I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the new legal strategies that uh, f folks, including uh, the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, where I work, have been using over the past couple of years. Um, but first, I wanna tell you a little bit about what hasn't worked, um, because the sad fact is that 30 years of efforts to regulate have essentially failed to stop and let alone reverse the environmental, social, and human health problems caused by the lagoon and spray field system. Um, so starting in the early 90s, counties and local citizen groups attempted 
to stop the influx of swine CAFOs using zoning and other local challenges, but they ultimately failed at the, ha at the hands mostly of state preemption. Um, meanwhile, a couple of catastrophic lagoon breaches and hurricanes in the mid-1990s caused the governor and, let's say reluctantly, the legislature to take notice. We live in one of those weird purple states where we often have a Democratic governor and a Republican legislature. Um, take that for what it is. In 1995, a lagoon breach spilled 25 million gallons of hog waste into the New River. In the following year, Hurricane Bertha struck and spilled another like, 1.8 million gallons. Um, and then in 1999, the big one, Hurricane Floyd came through and caused uh, at least five of these swine lagoons to burst and caused uh, at least another 47 to flood and overtop. In 1996, the Raleigh News and Observer, our uh, paper of record, uh, published a five-part series called Boss Hog. Um, it actually won a Pulitzer Prize. The five-part series explained to the city folks in Raleigh, where I grew up, how the corporate takeover of the swine industry in our state uh, and elsewhere was working, um, how that was working out for sort of the, the folks in the rural, <clears throat> excuse me, the rural parts of the state. Uh, in any event, all of this, the community groups, the massive spills, the bad press, uh, plus a blue ribbon commission, commissioned by the governor, um, ended in legislative action that established a new lagoon moratorium in 1997. And that was temporary at the time, it's since been made permanent. Um, and that essentially said there would be no new lagoons built to store swine waste absent some very strict environmental performance standards. And basically since 1997, no new lagoons have been built in North Carolina. But of course, um, that moratorium grandfathered in the existing lagoons. In 2000, the Smithfield Agreement was reached between the North Carolina Attorney General um, and Smithfield Foods, the big hog producer, uh, that was intended to deal with the grandfathered lagoons. So Smithfield committed to funding research for developing new technologies for waste management and promised to implement them on their facilities. Uh, essentially what they promised, oh, yep, that super soils. Essentially what they promised were to install environmentally superior technologies um, that would eliminate all waste discharges, all animal waste discharges, substantially eliminate ammonia emissions and odors, uh, substantially eliminate the release of disease transmitting vectors and airborne pathogens, and substantially eliminate nutrient and heavy metal contamination in soil and groundwater. And since 2007, multiple environmentally superior technologies, this is, describes one of them, have been tested on North Carolina swine farms and proven capable of meeting all five of those standards, and Smithfield refuses to install them. Permitting, also a possible solution to this problem. Um, North Carolina requires facilities with more than 250 hogs to have a permit. It depends on the type of hog, but 250 for, for your standard finishing hogs. Um, and that could be either a state or a NIPTES permit, for those of you who are learning about this in your ag and environmental law class. Um, and all but a couple of farms use the state's permit. They use the state permit because it's less stringent um, than the federal one. And I can get into a little bit of why that is if, if you want to ask later on or come find me uh, at the reception. So I don't know, oh, don't know how I got in there. Uh, <laughs> that said, some recent novel strategies have given us some new hope. Uh, first is the Title VI complaint. Um, that's Title VI of the Federal Civil Rights Act, filed by Earth Justice and some others on behalf of uh, grassroots environmental uh, and environmental justice organizations in North Carolina. That was filed in 2014. Um, EPA did a preliminary investigation, sent some folks down to Eastern North Carolina, and they were basically horrified by what they found. And here are two quotes. They found adverse impacts from industrial swine operations on communities of color, and quote, retaliation, threats, intimidation, and harassment by swine facility operators and pork industry representatives against residents who filed complaints. In 2018, DEQ, that's our state environmental agency, uh, settled. And, um, and there are some meaningful positive steps that, that are coming out of that settlement. We shall see where that leads. Okay, some of you may have heard of our nuisance suits. In 2014, plaintiff's attorneys brought 26 cases on behalf of about 540 neighbors of swine CAFOs in federal court, almost all um, people of color. The cases are against Smithfield, interesting, not against the contract growers who grow Smithfield's hogs, 
And the cases are pure nuisance law. Um, they allege odors, ammonia, emissions, pests, truck noise, and other conditions associated with nearby swine farms negatively affect the use and enjoyment of plaintiff's property, uh, including health effects like burning eyes, respiratory problems, headaches, anxiety, spikes in blood pressure. Um, and they've made the case for punitive damages, which the lawyers in the room um, know all about. The, so the first trials happened last year. They produced some gigantic verdicts, which made national news. The biggest was for $473.5 million, later reduced um, because the state caps punitive damages. Uh, and of course, Smithfield appealed, and some key issues from the first five trials are now before the Fourth Circuit. One of the big questions is whether the updated right to farm law, which was passed in the wake of those nuisance suits, applies retroactively to prohibit these suits from taking place. Right. Uh, not sure how that got in there either. To make a long story short, in the wake of the first large verdict, Smithfield went to the legislature, got them to update NC's right to farm law, and the new version makes it virtually impossible for similarly situated neighbors to bring these kinds of nuisance claims in the future. Um, and what's next for the nuisance suits? One very real possibility is a settlement that a lot will depend on what comes down out of the Fourth Circuit, but that's something to keep an eye on if you're interested in these things. Okay, I'm gonna finally bring it back out a little bit. And I know I'm out of time, but I've only got a few more minutes. Um, I'm gonna shift gears because whatever happens with the suits, the elephant in the room is absolutely climate change, and it's a game changer. And the swine industry is primed for both adaptation and mitigation, as we've heard from some of the dairy um, and biodigester folks earlier today. On the mitigation side, ag, ag is a significant slice of total GHGs, we all know that. Um, and within ag, I believe that's the red on the top, livestock play a huge role. On the adaptation side, from Florida to North Carolina, hurricanes are becoming stronger and more frequent. NC has had two, North Carolina has had two 1,000 year storms in the past two years. And remember, I actually didn't describe this, but our state permit, similar to the NIPTES permit, allows a facility to discharge during a 25 year, 24 hour stormwater event. Okay. When big storms hit, bad things happen. Runoff increases, um, but that runoff is even worse than normal because operators have been spraying out their lagoons to lower the level, the waste levels prior to the storm. Lagoons over top, they, bu they burst, um, and animals, of course, die in large numbers, and then we have to deal with their bodies. On the plus side, climate change has created some strong market signals to swine companies like Smithfield. Um, so this is a picture from the Walmart Gigaton project. North Carolina also has a renewable portfolio standard, which has helped. We just heard about how that can, uh, the effects that that can have in a state. Um, and there are growing opportunities to sell carbon credits from manure management practices into voluntary markets, like in California, like in New England, if some you know, changes are made in, in Reggie. As a result, Smithfield, for its part, has responded by promising some large investments in retrofitting existing lagoons with anaerobic digesters that can produce energy. So this is a map of biogas potential. And Smithfield says it's taking the steps partly to meet the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions 25% uh, by 2025. And it also says that in partnership with Dominion Energy, it will spend $250 million to build biogas infrastructure over the next decade. It's a big chunk of money. All this is promising. Um, to a point. I believe that the current approach for addressing climate-related concerns on swine farms is unlikely to improve the other environmental, health, or justice problems um, and may, in fact, make them worse. And that's the key tension that I want all of us to grasp. That's the point of my talk. Smithfield's plan to install um, ADs on existing lagoons does not come with any plans, none, to implement the environmentally superior technologies mentioned in the Smithfield Agreement. Um, and we just have to remember that waste to energy technology is not the same as environmentally superior technologies and does not address the environmental and public health harms associated with the Lagoon and Sprayfield system. Perhaps worse, uh, waste to energy technology by itself may make impacts of the Lagoon and Sprayfield system worse. Um, for example, by applying additional pressure down on these unlined lagoons by concentrating available nutrients in the effluent that, that then gets sprayed because you're not volatilizing some of it like you would be in an open pit, and by increasing the ammonia and nitrous oxide emissions on hog farms. 
Uh, worse still, it seems that the distribution of biogas may impose additional disproportionate burdens on communities of color. You have to get this stuff off the farm somehow. And I would say my personal take is that we desperately need climate action anywhere and everywhere, um, but justice and specifically climate justice is more than just reducing greenhouse gases. It's about correcting for historical inequality that is rooted in racism and other systems of oppression. So I'm already over, so I'm just gonna keep going. <laughs> we lost a panelist, so we have a little extra time, I was told. Um, okay. Uh, I'm just gonna take one more minute and I wanna explain why I think uh, North Carolina's move towards swine biogas is a microcosm of kind of a national movement towards decarbonizing agriculture. And um, we all know that there's huge and growing investment in limiting greenhouse gas emissions and generating carbon credits through agriculture. And with this focus, I believe comes the real threat of ignoring and even worsening other environmental health and justice concerns. So as John, I don't see him in the room, but as John mentioned this morning, um, climate change is of course existential and we need all hands on deck. The world is burning. Uh, if we're going to have swine CAFOs, if we're going to have the lagoon and spray field system, we sure as hell need to capture the methane. The big question is, as agribusiness figures out how to make money off of climate mitigation, what is their responsibility to fix the pre-existing and ongoing environmental harms that, they're, that they, they are causing? Um, and that's not an idle question because it's happening now. So folks in the room have a sense, we just heard about it, for some of the money, private and public, that could be spent over the next decade decarbonizing agriculture. And whether that's indigo ag, um, or whether that's carbon offsets under SB 32, or REGI, or whether it's a green 2023 farm bill um, that you know, turns the Commodity Credit Corporation into a big carbon bank, which I've heard discussed, uh, the issue is the same. If you set up a system that rewards farmers or agribusiness for growing a hell of a lot of any single commodity, you will get a monoculture producing that commodity, even if that commodity is carbon offsets. So um, again, as John spoke about so compellingly this morning, you cannot maximize both ecosystem benefits and food production. And I think my point is really that when you break that down and look inside of environmental and ecosystem services provided, potentially provided by agriculture, you can't even maximize all of the environmental benefits. Um, you, cannot, you can't maximize all the environmental benefits, period. Uh, and at least not within the sort of dominant agribusiness paradigm that we're living under, at least in North Carolina. There are always going to be trade-offs. In the case of hogs in North Carolina, paying for carbon mitigation actually makes a broken system that is poisoning our water, air, and bodies more economically viable. It puts money back into those farms. And if you care about small and medium farms, about farms that have been farming uh, small, o oh, organically, um, or agroecologically or regeneratively, then I think you should bring a healthy skepticism to the coming tide of interest in ag as climate mitigator. Done right, it can boost the incomes and the resilience of folks who are farming responsibly, but it can just as easily contribute to the widening inequality gap between farmers who are making it and farmers who aren't, and it can drive further consolidation. Like many of you, I believe in resilient ag and for paying farmers for all ecosystem services, not just carbon mitigation. And like many of you, I believe that agribusiness should be held to account when it causes harm. And we are going to have to fight for those principles in the coming years, even as we fight like hell to decarbonize agriculture. And that's what I hope you take away. Thanks so much for your patience. That's all I've got. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm glad I'm an alfalfa farmer. That pig thing. Um, just in my bio, I didn't really say, but just so it's um, my experience in agriculture, and um, I grew up in it, grew up farming. My family has been farming in Arizona for pretty much ever. Um, we started farming in Colorado 25 years ago, and 10 years ago, my wife and I bought 50% of the interest in my family's farm there, and that's where I've camped out um, ever since. Um, Slight slide there. What, um, so 10 years ago, I left um, Monterey, California, beautiful spot, and came to Rocky Ford, Colorado. Is that, that, that arrow? Yes. And I'm gonna come over here real fast. Um, 
as I was driving from uh, California 22 hours, and this is the front range of Colorado, um, the Kansas state line is down there a little bit, Pueblo is here, Colorado Springs, Denver, uh, all, those, all those cities are dependent on Colorado River water through um, diversion dams, the um, Trans Mountain water. And the one thing that was uh, the most shocking, I had been there once or twice before, but literally living in this place. Up here, 40,000 acres of farmland bought out by the city of Colorado Springs for the water. And that was about 30 years ago. They bought the water and left it. Just the farms were abandoned. The whole, this whole county, Crowley County, Colorado, you can read about it in the, in the internet. Uh, the economic, it's dead, the whole town. There's nothing there. There was, uh, now when wind blows, it's just a catastrophe. 20 years ago, let's see, 20, uh, the city of Aurora, outside of Denver, bought right around through here, around six or 7,000 acres of farmland, probably the most productive farmland. Uh, they dried it up, but since then, laws were put in place to revegetate. So now they actually, I have to admit, Aurora did a great job. I wish the farmland wasn't sold, but they did a great job revegetating and it's back to the way it was, um, whatever, 100 years ago. Uh, since then, in the last four or five years, Pueblo has bought 28% of this farm area up here, the Bessemer Canal, and they're looking, Colorado Springs is looking at buying, or they already bought, excuse me, maybe two or 3,000 acres down by, towards the end of the, the slide. So what we're looking at, so I came down, again, I left uh, Monterey, California, and said, wow, we have uh, four or 5,000 acres kind of all in this area. Um, every one of those transactions, willing buyer, willing seller. Why did the farmer sell? And, and that's, we know why the cities bought it, because they needed the water for their expanding population. So, you know, I, I began to think, you know, how do we make farming work? How do we make it profitable for, um, you know, for the remaining farmers? I'll come back over here. I just wanted to point out the spots on, the, on that map there. It, you know, how do we make it work? How do we make agriculture profitable so we don't want to sell? And I wanted to talk about three things today in my time. And the first is to prevent these cities from coming and buying out our water rights. And a number of farmers got together with our local conservation district and we created a lease following project where we actually will dry up land and then the water that would have gone to those fields is going to the cities. Um, we, this is our fifth, sixth year of doing it. The reason, again, expanding population in Colorado, our first contract was with the town of Security, which is by Colorado Springs, and one population. Their wells also got contaminated with uh, the fire retardant from the Predation Air Force Base. I can't, the PFCs, PFAs, I don't remember what they are. You guys, I'm sure, know. Um, so they needed water. And so from a farmer's perspective, how do we engage our neighbors, not only our local farmers, but our local municipalities? We don't want them coming in and just clearing us out wholesale. Um, so we created, again, these programs. We have since signed contracts with Colorado Springs, um, Security Fountain, the town of Fountain. Uh, we're talking to Aurora. And again, all the, a bunch of us farmers over the next 30 years, we have, I believe, a little under 200 million in contracts for water sales. Um, it's cheaper for the cities to come in and just buy us out, but the political will, I don't think, is there as much anymore. Um, but it's just one way to keep farming alive, keep it active, not to have a Crowley County, which is an ecological disaster. If you're ever in that part of the world, you do not want to go there, it's, it's bad. There's a few farmers that are left it's tough to get their water deliveries. So that was a, an important part of it. Um, aside from uh, the lease following, it, just so you know, it's a three year out of 10 program that you can actually dry your land up. Um, but it was a part of, again, what we're looking at is young farmer programs. I'm kind of gonna jump around a little bit with time. Um, with conservation easements in our valley, we feel we can get young men and women who are interested in agriculture. A conservation easement in that part of the world would maybe pay 40% of the land lease following three years out of 10 can pay for the other 50%. And so a young farmer can have land debt free um, within 10, 11 years. So something that, again, a side note on that. Uh, the second thing we're working on is pollutant trading in the Arkansas Valley. Um, obviously you can read phosphorus. Um, the one thing that we've noticed is ag isn't, you know, we keep hearing about how we're, we have, that's the Arkansas River, I don't think I said that. 
there are majorly polluted tributaries to it, and the Arkansas is fairly polluted. Um, so we're working on ways to clean that up. Uh, we just recently received a grant from the EPA for 1.2 million just last week. It's not, it's our second or third grant. Um, our biggest problem, we, we receive a lot of funds. We need engineers to actually design pipelines, sprinkler systems, drip irrigation. That's we have tons of resources in our conservation district. We just need lawyers to come out and uh, uh, work on our groundwater issues. Another thing I didn't mention on that first map is as a farmer, we have compact issues. There's not a lot of farmers that have to deal with uh, federal or interstate compacts. Colorado, Kansas, every time we make a water efficiency project, we put in a sprinkler, we put in drip irrigation, we put in an underground pipeline, we have to report it to Kansas. They'll actually come out and inspect it. Um, if I'm drying up land to take that water to Colorado Springs or Fountain, they actually will come, the state of Kansas will send representatives and make sure we're actually drying up the land. The compact is really screwy. It's um, but it's been around for a long time, and those are issues that we have to deal with also in that part of the world. So phos phos levels, uh, nitrogen levels, and selenium. These are some, the selenium and, and uranium issues are huge in our part of uh, the world. It's nothing we're doing. Obviously, we're not using uranium in our, as a fertilizer, um, but our farmland is, sits on um, shale layers, and it's just been sitting there for I don't know, millions of years, hundreds of thousands of years, I don't know how long, a long time. So every time where we irrigate, you know, the water deep percolates down and it shoots it out towards the Arkansas River. They're already picking up uranium levels or high uranium in alfalfa in, on the Kansas state line. Uh, so we're working with, um, obviously, a lot of people, EPA in particular, they've been a wonderful um, partner in working on clean, clean water, soil health, an amazing partner, and I, I would have never thought that uh, <laughs> when I was a EPA knocks at your door, it's like, whoa, what did I do wrong? And they're saying, what can we do to help? And it's, they've uh, have been fantastic, I have to admit. One of the things we're doing is um, just one of the small projects that we're doing. This is actually on our farm. It's called the Malinsky Farm. Uh, it's a 37 acre farm. The Tempest Creek runs to the left of that, of the slide. Extraordinarily polluted tributary that hits the um, Arkansas. There's a, where it says field, oh, field drain. I don't know if you can read that, it says field drain. There's a tile line that comes out there that was put in 50, 60, 70 years ago, I'm not sure. It spits out water 50 times the EPA standards for selenium. I mean, it's unreal. People go out there and make sure nobody ever drinks the water. Um, so that's one of the projects we're working with EPA. They funded drip irrigation on that field. Um, and then I since have added drip to the other ones. Um, our farm has a couple thousand acres, so we're doing right on that Tempest Creek, so we're spending a fair amount of time and effort to clean up uh, that river. Um, and here's, it, it's only been a few years, so this data is, is pretty young. So you can see that red line at the bottom is the national standard, and then it's bad, let's put it that way. And again, we're, we're trying to think outside the box. How do we clean up the river? And this is one of the ways drip systems here, um, about 30 miles from that farm, our conservancy district has, um, well, we, they don't have, they have there's 2,000 acres that farmers have let us put sprinkler systems, underground pipelines, measuring devices, and 2,000 acres. That's, I think that's why the EPA likes us, because we actually do stuff. We put projects, and we were very results-oriented. Um, and then I wanted to focus lastly, oh, pollutant trading. Well, to continue on that, um, as part of our lease following, we were, all of those cities in the Arkansas Valley are all, our cities, little communities, very small towns, 3,000, 5,000, 8,000 people. Virtually everyone is under variance with their waste treatment facilities. And that's one of the things we're working with them. Um, you know, we can dry up, my farm particularly, I can dry up 100 acres, give them, give that one particular city 80 million gallons of river water, clean water, to dilute out any of their problems. And those are some of the things, because, and then the next city next to us, they just spent 20 million on a waste treatment facility. And they're already, they're, by the time they turn that on in a few weeks, or maybe they turned it on two weeks ago, it's out of variance already. And so we're looking at ways for pollutant trading, how um, a city like Lahana or Rocky Ford or Swink or Aurora, any of these towns, where they can make investments in uh, some of the best management projects, whether it's drip irrigation, sprinklers, underground pipelines, 
And we're trying to figure out the baseline for all these, right? And that particularly out of that 2,000 acre farm, what's the baseline? What, what's it been for the last really 100 years? By putting up sprinklers, all these different improvements, what kind of, um, how we're improving the river. And from that, we can work on pollutant trading. EPA has been great on that. They've issued guidelines um, that's out for discussion. Uh, across the country, or however those type of things work, I don't, really don't know. But I know they're, uh, they're giving us a lot of leeway. Going on um, some of our best management practices that we're, we're working on, um, again, and then I'm gonna start talking more on soil health and uh, water quality. Uh, pretty much laser leveling. Uh, we, if, in Colorado, we need to have level, or both Colorado and Arizona. In Arizona, we farm flat by flat for the most part, so the water flows pretty, easily. Colorado, it's a little up and down, but we do laser level pretty much everything. Uh, precision application. One of the things, and again, about um, dumping, you know, phosphorus or nitrogen or whatever into the river. Uh, precision agriculture, these big sprayers, um, all GPS run, extremely accurate. One of the things we try to do on our farm is to put a lot of our um, fertilizers, herbicides, insecticides, or the most we can is in the wintertime, in the spring, right before a snow comes or a rain. That way we don't have the runoff. In this part of the world, we farm on beds. You really can't see it there. Oh, there'll be a slide coming up, you'll see it. But we farm on beds and the engineers tell us that 36 to 40% of the water actually stays in the field and then 60% flows off and then heads back to the river. So what can we do to prevent some of these leaching or runoff of nitrogen or phosphorus or anything? Um, we do a lot of composting. This is actually gonna be a hemp field next year, so we're just kind of getting it. We just did this a couple days ago. I, I love compost. We put about five tons per the acre on most crops. If we use just regular manure, we do 20 to 30 tons. It's enough fertilizer for our alfalfa crops for three to four years. Um, so we love um, that kind of product. Actually, that's near the drip field that I was showing you earlier. Uh, sprinklers, we have a few. Uh, this is some of the testing equipment that our conservation district does. We have soil mo probes, wells, and a lot of these things just to understand, you know, where are we? What, what, how is the, the land? Nobody's looked at these things in, I don't think, forever. Um, so we're just trying to understand what type of water or the amount, quantity of water it takes to grow a crop. Uh, this one is with a cover crop. Usually, um, we've been working on soil health for a long time, particularly uh, cover crops for the last six or seven years. And we've tried a lot of different things, turnips and this and that. The one thing I liked the best was uh, like a Sudan grass. Uh, they call it hay grazer out there. It gets six or seven feet tall. Um, I have zero patience. I want to get our organic matter up. Right now when we started six, seven years ago on these type of projects, we were at 1.8, 1.9% organic matter. Um, so what I do is grow this crop. This field, we just shredded it. And just to see how it breaks down over time, it was just an experiment. Oh, with drip irrigation, this is a hemp field. Um, this year we have about 600 acres in drip. Um, our hemp uses about an acre foot per acre, which is, I think, pretty spectacular. Alfalfa is around five to six acre feet, so we're saving a lot of water. Um, also, as you guys know, precision delivery of our fertilizers, and um, we can adjust pH levels fairly well. This is the one thing that was, we've been really having fun with the last five or six years, where we'll actually grow a crop, shred it, and again, I have zero patience. I would love to see our organic matter get up to the threes and four percents. So I don't really want to wait five or six years, seven years, eight years. So we actually grow the crops, shred it, we plow it under. And this will be the last time we probably ever put a plow on this farm or any of our farms once we do this. We're getting seven, eight tons of green manure into the soil. Um, this is what it, we farm. As again, I mentioned we farm on beds. Those are 40 inch beds. You can see a lot of that trash. Um, I believe it looks like maybe we've already planted, I'm not sure. But this is our water flowing. Typically on a new crop, it takes 36 hours for the water to completely black out the whole bed so that you know, the seed will start, will germinate, start growing. And you can see it's already blacking out with all that organic material in there. We're, we're doing this in 12 to 16 hours. We're using half the water. Um, we're not getting the runoff um, erosion out of these fields. So it's been pretty exciting, some of these projects. Um, one of the things we worked on this year, again, on no-till, again, soil health. How do we get our regenerative practice? How do we get our, our soil better? 
and we custom built a, and I wish I had a, more of a close up, but this was a, what was this? Oh, this was a hay grazer field. And again, we farm on beds. In the past, you'd go out there, or even today, you disc, you rip, you plow. I mean, you just go through, every time you just take all these steps through a field. And so we built this, this implement, and actually just, it's on the beds, just moves the dirt three inches one way and takes it back so it breaks up. So we, again, we're irrigated. We have to have a path for the water to flow. And so within 24 hours, this is the same field. We're already planting. Uh, the tractor on the right is just make, cleaning the furrows a little bit better so the water will flow. Um, so we're, we're actually rotating our crops. You know, that was a, well, it wasn't that big a filling. It was a 20-acre field. But we're, changing, we're, we're moving through these fields a lot quicker. Uh, not disturbing the soil. Our goal has been, you know, bring earthworms back. Bring get again. We we all know that these practices, these soil health practices. Um, this has been fantastic. This is a game changer for us to be able to um, go through every. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. I think, and I think that's it. Um, oh, there you go. <laughs> All right, so I get to run over too, right? <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me here, and thanks for putting on this great event. It's so, so important, and I was so excited to hear the topic being uh, bridging the gap, reconciling agriculture with environmentalism. My name is Lisa McCrory. I have a farm in Bethel, Vermont, about 12, 15 miles from here. So it was an easy commute, didn't need any food or lodging compensation. Um, we have, uh, along with being a farmer, and my bio shows all this stuff, I, I have been an activist farmer, my husband and myself, ever since we, we met. We actually met at a gathering talking about genetically modified food and how that fits into our food system and an agricultural system. So uh, we're very involved with an organization in our state called Rural Vermont. And I really wish that there were more organizations like that state by state to help fight for the important issues around viable um, environmental systems and biological systems and economic justice for farmers. Uh, what you're gonna see with our farm is a very, very, it's beyond small farm. I would call it a micro farm. So um, am I gonna control it with this? How do I do that, that? All right. There we go. So our farm is, a, we're a certified organic operation. We're also draft animal powered and we're very much a homestead farm. So this uh, plot of land that you see is about 200 acres of which, uh, oh, I pushed the wrong button. Put it around in your hand. Oh, goodness, there we go. Um, there we go. So we get a close up, a closer view of our land base and you can see that we own 188, we rent about 14 and our breakdown, it, we have a very much, it's a hillside farm, not a lot of flat land, um, not like Colorado, <laughs> very different, but you have to farm based on what your environment uh, provides. Um, within our land base, we have about 25 acres of pasture, about an acre of gardens. We have some pine plantation, sugar bush for our maple sugaring, and about 120 acres of a diverse forest stand for our firewood and to build our forest ecology on our farm. For products and livestock, we've got three draft horses, a team of oxen. We raise about 40 heritage turkeys every year for Thanksgiving. Uh, we raise four to eight pigs every year on a rotational grazing system. 200 meat birds we'll raise each year, of which I think some of it was served in our lunch today, that we raise on pasture and market each year. And then we have our layers. Uh, I milked a cow this morning before I got here. Uh, couple ha so we usually have one or two milk cows and we usually have a beef animal to fill our freezer. It's, it's our, our ultimate goal is here's our mission here, to steward the land in a way that promotes a healthy, robust soil biology and forest ecosystem, increases carbon sequestration, improves water quality, and increases the water holding capacity of our soils. So that's, that's, that's why we're in this. But 
And here's a list of the many things that we do on our farm. And people will say, you know, why do you have so many things? Well, our primary purpose is to feed ourselves and to raise our children in an environment where they can have the skills to do the same. So this is our own, um, this is, this is our, our weapon <laughs> of survival, right? This is things that we all knew how to do if we lived in the United States 100 years ago, 150 years ago. I would say most of us here would have had an agricultural background. Now we're less than 2% of the population. So my husband and I, when we met, we knew that what we really needed was to have a land, land base where we could feed ourselves and we could understand that system and we could bring our kids up in an environment where they knew how to do that as well. So here's my family. This is my extended family, but they are like, this is, you know, from my brothers, my sisters, my mother, my, uh, my, my kids, uh, our spouses. Um, they're why we do this. Now, so we'll get into the various components of, of our diversified system. You know, carbon sequestration, that's an important part of, of our farm. We wanna, farm. we wanna use a land base and we don't wanna overuse it. We don't wanna put too many nutrients back on the land. We don't wanna take too much away so that we exhaust it. So we're building carbon and we're doing that in a number of ways. This quote from Aldo Leopold, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. So, you know, I'm not take, collecting a lot of data, but we tend to know when we're going in the right direction. And as you can see, this is my husband and our two boys who are now significantly older, but they've been doing this. This is, they wake up and this is what they know. And I'm just so proud of uh, the, what we've been doing as a result. Oh, darn it, doing it again. Okay, so around our house, we have a couple different houses on the property, but around, we built our house out of uh, lumber from our property itself. So it was all built by hand. And surrounding our farmhouse is about an acre of gardens, uh, an edible landscape of a greenhouse, uh, poultry houses, uh, our, our vegetable gardens, our herb gardens, the pastures around the gardens are are there to feed our, our poultry who are raised in movable poultry houses. So if it ever came to creating energy out of um, manure that's collected from livestock, our farm would not fit because all our manure is going into the soil as soon as it leaves the animal. We're not collecting manure into piles that creates a, um, a nutrient waste issue. Our system is a biological system that's cycling nutrients all the time. Come on, okay, went too fast. Our gardens, one thing I really got interested in a number of years ago by being involved with an organization called the Bionutrient Food Association is really looking at how to not disturb the soil. So we, with our, with our gardens, we use a lot of raised beds so that the only time of, type of disturbance that we're creating is where the vegetables are gonna get planted. And in between the rows, it's all sod. So if I'm using any fossil fuels, or it's, it's gonna be using a weed whacker <laughs> to, to mow the grass down in between. But that is gonna contribute a lot to our water consumption needs. We don't need as much, we really count on rainfall to, to water most of our gardens. And when we don't capture uh, the rainfall from the sod. We've got a few locations on our farm where we capture water off our roof, roofs and it goes into containment uh, vessels that can then uh, irrigate different parts of our farm. And you see we've got a picture of our pastured pork and our pastured poultry. The pork we use as rotivators. So if we're, we've got some pine plantation that we are we have a five year plan where we're gonna be turning that back into pasture. And so the pigs play a really critical role in, in turning up the soil so that we can establish some new grasses and forages where otherwise it would have been raspberry bushes and tree saplings and stuff like that. So they, they do a lot of rotivating for us. We follow up with a little broad seeding, uh, broadcast with, by hand. We don't have any, um, big pieces of equipment aside from our livestock. So it's, it's a very much a labor of love. We go at a much slower pace. That's kind of the way I like it. Um, and 
And then with our, our, our chickens, we usually try to find a location where, where do we need some extra nitrogen, where do we need some extra nutrients so that we can move those meat birds in an area to really increase the fertility of that area. We're, some of our restrictions might be predator issues. You know, We have working farm dogs that protect us in the farm and the livestock, but if, uh, if we go too far away from where the dogs are planted, then we can have issues that might steal some of our precious cargo. So. Uh, this next picture is another great example of, of carbon sequestration. You see our, our small group of bovine are grazing a plot of grass, and if you see the lighter grass in front of the picture, that's, that was yesterday's feed. So they get 12-hour pieces of pasture. They're on, they're off. They harvest, they leave manure, and, and then if you look at the root systems next to that, you'll see what we're looking for is building root systems similar to the, the mass that's over there to the far right. That's what we're doing with a good regenerative grazing system. And I'm gonna move a little faster because I got the five minute mark, but I'm gonna go over, what, 15 minutes? <laughs> Less time for questions. Right, right, right. Um, using our, our animals, you know, again, we're trying to not rely so much on fossil fuels. We, we use our draft horses and our oxen as a way of moving timber and, and mowing fields, doing as much motive power from our livestock as we can. And in, a, in exchange, what they're also doing is they're out there grazing, cycling nutrients for us. They're grazing areas that I couldn't possibly plant something in. So when we talk about number of farming acres, when we look at those statistics, I was never good at multiple choice questions or exams because I'm like, what does farming mean? I mean, how are you actually determining what farmland is? And then you'd have to go into those deeper levels. But where these guys are grazing, I don't think you'd be calling that farmland. I think you'd be calling it, you know, I don't know what you would call it in legalese, but they're able to capture and cycle nutrients in areas where I wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. And so they play up multiple roles for us on the farm. Uh, water systems are really important for us too. Uh, the picture to the left is um, child labor, unpaid, <laughs> making sure that our animals are getting water. The saying to the right is the situation that does not happen on our farm because we make sure that the water comes to the livestock, whether it's coming from a, a water source that we've captured or it's, uh, it's not gonna come out of a brook or stream. We're not gonna let our animals go into a pond or a brook or stream to create erosive situations like that. Uh, one thing we did implement through some NRCS funds was to trap some of our subsurface water that was uh, creating issues in our barnyard. And because we weren't, we couldn't call it a nutrient management issue, even though it was for us, because the barnyard was too far away from a brook or a stream based on NRCS, uh, you know, whatever the requirements were. But we could call it a water containment. We were putting in a cistern to trap that subsurface water. So we got a benefit out of it. And NRCS was happy with the fact that we created a water system that then gravity feeds water to all our pastures. So about a mile's worth of uh, plastic pipe that takes the water to our animals so that we can keep them in small paddocks and let them have water right where they are. Um, okay, and then just a little bit about our, um, here's our off-grid. So we live off-grid as well. So this is our log house that we built from the lumber on our farm. A labor of love, it took about three or four years before we were to move in. But you get all the, the different things that we needed. We've, we've got our portable sawmill, so we're gonna build a new deck on our porch this year. Um, can't do it until my husband harvests the logs and then we've got a mill of the log. <laughs> you know, it's not just going to the, the, the you know, store and buying your ingredients. We've gotta harvest it and prepare it so it's more of a process, but we embrace it. So we have a root cellar to store our feed, solar panels for our primary energy, a dug well that gravity feeds to our house. Um, our, we have a very conservative, uh, the way we use the energy in our homestead, which we really like to trickle into the whole farm. And again, this is how we did this 100 years ago, guys. This is like, we're living today's time and it's really doable, we still have Wi-Fi in the house. Our kids still stream movies all the time, but we also can manage to live lightly. I mean, the energy that we use in our homestead is about 20% of what uh, a four-person household uses in the United States. And it's not because 
households can do much better, but we're just used to having all these conveniences. But there's, you know, anybody today could easily get reduce their energy intake or usage by at least 25% just by doing, doing some simple skills. But with ours, we're able to cut it back even more. And this is just showing how we capture water for the gardens. Uh, this our root cellar, our off-grid power system so we can store the surplus energy in our battery banks. Uh, we heat our water through our wood, wood stove. The heat from the wood stove heats our water in the wintertime. We have copper solar panels that trap the, that capture the heat in the summertime so that we can have hot water to take showers or wash dishes, et cetera. We heat exclusively with wood, uh, which is renewable on our farm. <laughs> um, there's our solar panel array. And uh, last, lastly, my last couple minutes I'll, I'll, um, is, is marketing our products and services. But that's a challenge with a farm our scale. We are so small that we don't really fit into the models of the various uh, federal and state funds that are out there to help and support farmers that are doing things right. We don't have big issues, so we don't stand out as an outlier with critical stuff with projects that would cost thousands of dollars. Our projects are like, yeah, a couple thousand dollars here would be greater if we could get some help with you know, reseeding a pasture we would appreciate, you know, but we don't, we can't even access those funds because they've already gone to the farms that have huge issues. So it's hard to get rewarded for doing things right when, when it's, har it's hard to support it. Even with, you know, what we charge for our food, we sell a little bit of everything off our farm, which is great for what we do. But we're also, we, we know what it costs to make what we make. And w our prices, don't compete very well when you've got those industrial farms selling things for half the cost. I mean, our chicken is six fifty a pound. When you can buy it for a dollar a pound in the grocery store, it's, it's hard to compete with that. But if you understand where and how it's being done, that's the rub. That's where we need to educate people. And I want to take one second and just give an example. I have a, a friend of mine who lives in a very visible area in Huntington doing amazing things with his small scale farm. His biggest issue right now are, are uh, I'm gonna just say, uh, vegan interest groups that think that his animals are outside being abused and neglected because they don't understand what they're seeing. So it's taking a lot of time on his part to deal with law enforcement and, and, to, con and to try to educate neighbors that don't understand and don't want to understand because they have issues with people consuming meat. So we not only need to educate ourselves again as to how food is raised and how food makes it to our table so that we can make sound decisions. We've also got to support people when they're doing things right. And when we see animals out in a pasture, if you don't understand, have a conversation. But to, anyway, my friend has got some issues. And, and I welcome those kinds of conversations at our farm, but I'm grateful that I don't have to spend countless hours doing that when, when I've got things to do. Uh, we do slaughter all our animals on farm. We're committed to the process from birth to death. We feel like uh, humane slaughter is critical. It's the life of the animal that we're focusing on, and we want their death to be quick and painless, and we don't want them to know, you know, that's not what we're marketing. We're marketing the process. And, and we have a real intimacy with our food system. Uh, here's a picture of my husband and with some of our pastured pork, even though they've got a whole bunch of area that they're opening up, but we had a group of people coming to learn more about our system, and they're so friendly, they just wanna come over and see what's going on. So you can go in there, scratch their back, they, you know, uh, the picture on the left is, that's me milking the cow, that's what I do every morning, um, hand, hand squeezed milk, it's the best. Um, on farm slaughter, again, our, our annual beef animal raised on 100% grass, um, slaughtered on farm, marketed, thankfully, to rural Vermont. Um, we can now sell animals in quarters instead of having to sell a whole animal to one customer. Um, lots of legislation that's helping, um, helping us out, but it takes a lot of work to keep those liberties available for the small scale farmer that can't afford to jump through all the hoops that an industrial farm needs to do.
And we do a lot of education on our farm. Um, one of your law students is uh, it, there holding a chicken. <laughs> and I will say, you know, shout out, Lancy. And then also, you know, I would say I've also got my, my daughter in the audience. She's the next generation. And to talk about this being a success, you know, we don't make a lot of money doing what we do, but she's coming back to the farm. She wants to do this. So shout out to Thule as well. So I think this is my last slide, and this just summarizes the challenges that I feel that we face as a small scale farm that's intimately tied with the environment and the landscape. This, I think, is what you want, but how can you support us? Because we need your support. It's hard for us to qualify for conservation grants, as our, pro our farm projects are small and most of the funds are allocated to projects on larger farms. They, the funds just run out, as was said earlier. Um, our costs of production require that we charge a price that's high enough to cover those practices. Sometimes it's too high for people. Um, working with a dynamic biological system, it's important to maintain a diversified landscape. Um, Monocrop reductionistic forms of agriculture do not fit in our farm model. And um, yeah, our management and our products differ from those of the large farm model. And, and that's not a message that's immediately understood, but I hope that these discussions and this level of understanding will happen on a broader, and I, and I think we need to get this started in the school system. I'm, I'm on the school board, um, which I felt like I needed to do. I needed to play a role and represent um, the needs of, you know, the messages that I might come, that might come to me. I don't really have the time, but I need to make the time. And, and so that's my um, contribution to my community for now. So that's, that's it. I think, did I go over as much as you guys? <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much to all of the panelists. Um, and now we have time to open it up for questions from the room. You know, this is the enviable last slot in a long conference, and so it might take a minute to shake those questions out. So maybe while we're waiting, um, we, we've heard a little bit about this from some of the panelists, and uh, it was, you know, in, in John's keynote earlier today, he suggested that the next farm bill had the potential to be transformational on a lot of these issues, and so um, I'd love to hear more from the panelists how the farm bill currently impacts the work that you do or sort of your interaction with the farm bill and some of the pros and cons that you see in its implementation and any recommendations that you have for the next farm bill, which is not all that far away. <laughs> I think the, um, this past farm bill helped a little uh, as a hemp grower um, in Colorado or anywhere in the country, I was disqualified from any equip funding with NRCS. I mean, the, the NRCS staff couldn't even step foot on our farm. I mean, it was bad. And we have a 20 year history of huge projects and we were, uh, we couldn't, but anyways, it's supposed to be cleared up in the next few weeks or maybe it is. Uh, the one thing that was important for us and the other, again, going back to EQIP and NRCS, um, before projects were for kind of individuals, I guess, if you wanted to put a sprinkler or a drip, the things that we do in the West anyways, and this one will allow company-wide or ditch-wide projects up to 10 million. In our, um, I didn't really explain on the Arkansas River, there's got seven or eight diversion dams. Pretty much they're all gravity fed. I think all of them are gravity fed. Then the water comes to your, to your farm. Well, our system was put in 1884 and there hasn't been a whole lot of progress since then. And we're hoping to, and that's, that's huge for this farm bill to be able to put on big projects, conservation, um, measurement. We have no idea. You know, every farmer is entitled to their specific amount of water. We don't even know if we can even do that today. So that's great for us, I think. I is this on? Okay. So I think one, I mentioned this earlier when our keynote was talking that I would I think a benefit so a change that would be beneficial would be within Equip and NRCS if people could qualify for projects without having to have an environmental issue to begin with, if there could be some um, working on the offensive, helping people develop systems and plans that are going to uh, put, bring us in the right direction without having a problem first, that would be a, a really big deal. 
I think this is an excellent point. It's dangerous to ask me an open-ended question about far the Farm Bill because it's one of my favorite things to talk about. <laughs> um, it's a big problem that we, the, the conservation title as it's written is not meant to pay farmers who are the early adopters, who are on the cutting edge, who are doing the right thing and have been for years or decades. Um, and it would be great to see that changed. I think, to keep my answer short, I th one of the, the exciting things about this conversation around the 2023, 2024 Farm Bill, whenever it does come, um, that I would love to hear us start talking about is what it would look like to replace uh, the Title I and crop insurance programs with, uh, with an actual um, green payment program and really put incentives out there through the way that we're paying the largest producers um, to start adapting and adopting these practices. And there's a lot of work going on in, in this field and I'd love to talk with folks about it if they're interested in that. But um, you're seeing some of this around the margins already. So in you know, Iowa has a pilot right now where they're, they're basically cutting five bucks off your um, premium subsidy per acre if you'll plant cover crops. That's like a pretty big sea change from where we were a few years ago when farmers were essentially prevented from planting cover crops if they wanted to qualify for crop insurance. Um, but things like that are moving in the right direction and I think we could go a hell of a lot further. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Mithil. Um, I come from Maryland, so we have a lot of poultry um, on the Eastern Shore. I was just wondering if you guys were familiar. Um, I know Maryland has a program because we just Googled it, but um, <laughs> I was wondering if you could speak more intensely to that region and the poultry industry and their potential. I, I think it's like swine is definitely something that we talk about quite often. I think poultry is a little missed sometimes. I don't know. That's my personal thought. But Yeah, that seems like it's for me. Um, <laughs> so right, you're, I mean, specifically in Delmarva, right? And it's... Uh, okay. Uh, the, so the peninsula that comes down, that's where yes. most of the yeah. poultry has been concentrated. And, um, and my understanding, I haven't worked in Maryland, but my understanding is that things are getting better uh, in large part because of, um, of some nutrient caps and, and trading that's gone on. A lot of uh, payments for things like cover cropping. I know at least at one point Maryland was paying farmers like two or three times the equip cost share rate the standard rate to plant cover crops. That makes a big difference. Um, so I don't, I, maybe we can chat a little bit afterwards. I, I, I know that we're about to, we are dealing with poultry in North Carolina. Um, if I could you know, bring the map back up that showed where the, all that concentration of, of hog CAFOs are, that's exactly where poultry are now moving in and often on the same, um, on the same operations. There are poultry houses going up all the time, and we're talking, you know, million, even two million bird operations, um, almost all broilers and a lot of turkeys. So, yeah, I, let's let's connect afterwards, and and we can compare notes. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> cool beans. Um, my question is for Elisa, and um, I was just wondering. I know you talked about it's a lot about a labor of love and how you're a small farm and but you're making a lot of amazing um, efforts in conservation. What would be your kind of advice to larger farms and industrialized farms that to adopt the same kind of philosophy that you have on your farm, um, even the smallest of um, recommendations? That's a, I, I think a lot of these larger farms are tied in with a lot of debt and a lot of equipment, a lot of investment that they need to pay back. So they're almost locked into a, a nightmare. And without, you know, it's hard to turn the ship around. And, and to say, on, but on the flip side, I gotta say that I have seen a number of large scale farms make adjustments and turn, you know, what might be a confinement operation into a grazing operation. And there's a lot of paradigm shift, there's designs that it doesn't happen overnight. And as they get better and see the results from those management changes, then they can start to shed some of those um, pieces of equipment that they might not need anymore. But if we're talking to, I mean, even if it's a 200 cow dairy, 
Um, it, if you're talking about larger industrial farms, I don't have a lot of personal exposure to those being in Vermont, but it, it's, it doesn't happen overnight, you know, because not only do people need to acclimate to new ideas and new ways of thinking, then they go through a process of feeling like what they were doing before was wrong, and they start to, you know, you get the shame, you get the anger, you, you know, you get a lot of emotional stuff that can get tied in with it as well. If it, so it, it can be complicated. I guess I can't answer that for, you know, it's hard to say that in a general way, but there are plenty of examples of people that have, farmers that have made changes and, and gone a new route and they're all over the place in a lot of the ecological ag magazines, success stories of how one farmer went from a monocrop to a more diversified and, and what happened to the soil profile, what happened to carbon sequestration and profit and all of that. So there's great success stories, but they, they're gonna need mentors, they're gonna need support um, from other farmers, uh, lots of resources in order to make that happen. And that's how it works if, from my experience. If I can add in, when, um, you know, I look at our farm in, in Colorado and when I first went out there and, you know, how do, again, I, I think I, when I started off, I said, how do we make farming work? And, you know, you have to make adjustments. The, um, I would talk to two of our best employees are 75, 80 years old and, you know, what did you guys do other than, you know, pull a donkey or whatever they did 80 years ago? Um, you know, why are we doing these things? Why are we running a disc or why are we plowing? Why are we ripping? You know, I ask questions every day of, our, of my staff, uh, my form of why are we doing this? And if they don't give a satisfactory answer, will we change? We, we do things differently. Um, equipment, like you're saying, that's a huge part of it. You know, when we're, again, we're all main, predominantly alfalfa. You know, Swather's $165,000 these days. And we kind of program our whole farm around the swather. You know, it can cut 180 acres a day, and then we build equipment around it, balers and rakes and all the bale wagons. But, you know, we, we're adjusting. Everything we do, I look at it strictly economically. I mean, God, you know, we're putting fertilizer in and half of it's running out the bottom of the field. Or, you know, why are we running a tractor eight times through a, a field to plant a new crop. I and mean, we're, we're changing uh, significantly, you know, everything we do. And I came from it from a point of view of economics. You know, we got to make money. We got to put food on the table. And as it turns out, I think we're trying to build our soil health. We're, um, you know, not disturbing the ground as much. So, you know, we've been pretty pleased with, with our results so far. And do you, Philip, just to mm -hmm. expand on that a little more, do you feel like you're sort of an outlier in your region, or do you feel like the types of, and, and from your observations and conversations, are other farms also adopting the same types I, I of practices? I think slowly um, things are changing. I mentioned a few times the EPA last summer, they um, sponsored a trip, paid for, got a van, I guess, and took us up to South Dakota. Um, Dr. Beck, if, I don't know if anybody's in soil health, or him, he's phenomenal. Um, but we went up and spent a few days looking at what they were doing on uh, dry land farms, some center, a lot of center pivots. Um, and when we got back, one of the guys that was on our, um, on the tour, he's in from that Crowley County, which is abandoned. He still has 100 acres or 200 acres. He got rid of his plow, got, I mean, he sold everything. The next day when we got back and bought himself a, a, the, the grain drill, the heavy duty grain drill, the no-till grain drill, which are really expensive. And as a matter of fact, I asked him the other day if he had planned a field for me, which he hasn't done yet. But, um, <laughs> uh, but you know, so it's changed. And I, the next day or a few weeks later, I was watching um, his nephew who farms near us. And he had, you know, had a crop of, I think, hay graze or something he, that he was silaging. And he drilled in um, triticale or wheat. I wasn't sure because it was only, but right there, he, he didn't do anything to the ground, you know, kind of followed up on what his uncle had saw in um, South Dakota. So it's changing. I mean, you can see it, uh, and it'll change fast. And the one thing that we've, we've realized, you know, uh, people have said that you can't change the structure of the soil. It's just, you know, once we degraded it and it'll never go back, that's, that's a lie. I mean, we've, the things that we've seen over the last, and the, the folks in South Dakota would have confirmed that too. I mean, they're doubling, tripling their organic material just over the course of 10 years tops. And we're seeing that on our farm. We're the organic matter is, is taking off. So we're pretty excited. And other people, are, are, I think, are seeing what we're doing. I, I see more and more of the, the no-till drills, especially the guys that have center pivots, which we don't have. But, you know, they're harvesting their corn, and then you see them going through with not doing a whole lot of anything else, which is great. I'll just add one more thing, too, because before full-time farming, I used to work at UVM as a grazing consultant and a researcher. 
And then I worked for NOFA Vermont as an organic dairy technical assistance person. So I was, when I worked at UVM as a grazing consultant, I was working one-on-one -on -one with dairy farmers all over the state, helping them adopt grazing systems. And, and, and what, what worked best for them was to do things in small amounts at a time and to also learn in groups with other farmers and to visit other farms and see what's working. And then to have that continuous support of somebody like myself visiting their farm and giving them feedback and to also monitor the economics. So we were looking at a lot of different things but also looking at the bottom line so that they could see progress. And then when it came to organic dairy, I was working at NOFA when organic dairy became a thing. And, and uh, farmers were, Coming, there was a number of farmers that were ready to ship organic milk because they were they were doing they were in compliance from the very beginning and they believed in grass-based systems. But for the next farmers to come in that needed to make a lot of changes, the way the major incentive that helped them jump on and agree to start trying changes was knowing that they were going to get paid what they needed in order to make those changes. There was an economic incentive for them to ship organic milk, so they started grazing their animals better. They, they moved to organic grains. They started looking at animal health practices that they weren't familiar with already. But all those changes were incentivized with an economic um, you know, opportunity. So that was an, a very important part for a lot of the changes that I've seen. Are there other questions? Genevieve. I think this is a question mostly for Lisa. Um, we talk about community scale a lot, community solar, especially in renewable energy. And with your um, discussion about the marketing challenges, I'm wondering sort of what opportunities you see for community marketing and also sort of what the challenges to doing that are. I think the way that we're successful in marketing our products on our farm is the fact that we're small enough that people come to our farm and they see where their food is coming from and they appreciate um, the food that they're purchasing, whether it's vegetables or meat or crafts. They, they get to know us and they get to see the landscape and they, they're, they understand that what we're charging for a price is not we're not getting rich off of it, it's just our costs. And so that's a, an audience that has either searched us out or that we've built a rapport with. I think, you know, and I know that there's communities, there's people wanting to get more connected to their food, but as we were listening earlier today, that, you know, we're putting 8% of our income towards purchasing our food today, where it used to be, at 38% and there's other parts of the world where we're spending you know maybe an average of 18 to 20% of our income in, per, in in food we're in a cheap food system so there's a lot of paradigms that need to be changed and a willingness to also realize that what you're putting in your body is creating that body one of the other speakers was saying that every 7 years all your cells have been replaced and renewed. So if you think of your body as a temple and what you're putting into your body is actually creating more cells that are gonna replace those old cells, it becomes more important to know what you're putting in your body. And those community, small community market um, groups, I think would work as long as those discussions continue to happen and to really see, you know, when you buy a package of meat in the store, do you really re visualize that that animal, that was that that was an animal that was walking, you know, maybe even a month ago, you know, those kinds of discussions and that level of awareness and intimacy, the more that happens, I think the more people are going to be more than happy to pay the appropriate price for the food that they're eating. Because the cheap food that's out there, you are paying for it with your taxes and with your um, health. You know, it's, it's getting, it, you're paying for it, it's just not as obvious when you're purchasing the product from an organic farmer or a regenerative farmer like myself. 
I hope that answered your question. I don't know. I guess we're, oh, we have one more question. Sure, we have time for one more. I just wanted to ask um, whether, Lisa, whether you feel that the new consolidated school systems actually uh, are promoting this philosophy or is it, are we creating better consumers? Well, I hope that we're going in the right direction. I think that there's a lot going on with our school where the kids are getting out in the environment and there's a lot of activities where there's a lot more hands-on learning. It's, uh, and within our school system, there's a lot of local purchasing. There's a lot of creative food being served to the, the kids. I'm not seeing as many local field trips. I'd love to see more of that. Um, I, whether it's improving, I think it's at least staying where it was before. And I think as the school, it's only been a, we're in its second year of consolidation, so I think that it will get better over time, especially if there's people like me on the board nudging those issues along, and people like you as, in the, as, a, as a taxpayer and um, coming to meetings and asking those questions. Um, thank you. Yeah. The other thing, I just want to mention this, and I'm speaking really out of sheer ignorance, uh, so I really don't know what I'm talking about. But do you think the, uh, that we, uh, the way horsepower was converted to uh, apply to engines, uh, and it really came from a horse, and a, a person computated that mathematically. I was wondering if we could apply a, a, a figure to our energy uh, input. I mean, for every person in the world, in the sense that we are all occupying the planet and we all have a certain amount of energy that we're, we're uh, putting in. And, and then you compute what, like for instance, the San Joaquin Valley, uh, they're getting subsidized water uh, for, that the taxpayers are paying the, uh, for that water in California. Uh, that we should have a rate of the impact that we have on our, our, our planet and the amount of, of uh, energy that is being spent to, to get this result of what you call an efficient operation. I mean, you should have some way of, of addressing what efficiency really is. And as far as human uh, peace of mind, I think a farm produces a lot more than just uh, the product that they're selling. It's a calming influence on people and, and I think there ought to be a rating that if you're a, using a third world country for your labor to build your boots or whatever, you, you should have to account for that. Right, I agree. There should be some formula. And there should also, when you buy food, there should be a barcode so that you could swipe over it and, and, and see the life of that animal or know how that crop was raised and, and just get a snapshot of it so that you can really make a good judgment call of, do I really want to eat that? Do I really want to support that industry? And the same with materials, clothes that you buy, you know, where did that, energetically, where did that come from? And does it, does it balance out on, on a, on a net positive, or is it drawing from us psychologically, emotionally, or on, on an economic scale? I mean, Peter, I think you should work on that. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we're out of time, so we're gonna thank our panel again for their contributions today. And I know we have time in the reception to keep these conversations going, so thank you all. Thanks, Sophia. So we just wanted. Is this off again?
to build. Yes. Because yes. 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 that, I mean, that's what that's intended to do. And that's, okay. uh, I, that's through that's <laughs> funding, right? No, that's uh, okay. MCS. Well, okay. So we just started so working. We work thank with you all for coming. And, and applying um, for a number of things. And, and thank you again to our speakers and our moderators. We had enough funds for a couple things. So we got a, um, but we didn't. Yeah, we were, so it's we'll fine. be able to implement a few things um, you next spring. The conservation Okay, we just wanted to thank you all again for coming. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. This was an amazing event. Thank you again to American Farmland yeah, Trust for partnering with this. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll check yeah. in with my and name. thank you. Did you say service yeah. providers already? Yeah. yeah. Thank you again to the service providers. And we hope all of you guys can come to the reception. It's over in Yates. It should be up and running right about now. So go get some more snacks and some alcohol and stuff. <laughs> Have fun. <laughs>